A warm welcome to everyone from the Find Your Fire tribe. Here we are again on another Fire Friday. And I'm Wendy Yorching, founder of Healing Spaces Caribbean and also affectionately known as the tribe mom of the Find Your Fire tribe. And as you know, if you're a regular with us, that every Monday and Friday we do something special for your chi. Today's talk is going to be really wonderful. With me, I have Maureen Kalamia, who is a fellow feng shui expert, but she specializes in creating luminous spaces. In fact, that's the name of one of her books. And she also has a school, a feng shui school called Luminous Spaces School of Feng Shui. Maureen is here to share with us today her insights and how we can use biophilic design in our spaces. It's the topic of her conversation today is called bringing the outdoors in. And Maureen, the floor is yours. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome and huge gratitude for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Wendy, for inviting me here with your tribe and, and for allowing me to extend the invitation to um, others that I'm connected with. So thank you. And uh, as always, I love to talk about things that I'm passionate about. And uh, let's see, everyone can see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, awesome. Let me just try to, there we go. So, um, so the topic is, you know, bringing the, bringing the outside in or bringing nature into our spaces. And um, it is something that I find really, really, um, it's, it's, like I said, one of my passions um, that I only came around to probably in the last decade or so, um, a little bit more than a decade, I guess. And um, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of information on what this weird term called biophilia is and why it really matters in our spaces. So what is biophilic design? It really is rooted from that term biophilia, which means the love of living things. It was discovered by, um, or maybe it was not really discovered or just kind of recognized by a social psychologist. His name was Eric Fromm back in the 50s or 60s. And he, he put this term biophilia uh, to represent that, you know, as humanity, we gravitate toward life. We love to be or we are attracted to places that feel good, that feel healthy and vibrant. Um, not just plants, but they're big, right? Um, but, you know, living things, um, wildlife, um, domesticated animals, other people, you know, this is all life. And I, when I heard this term first, I recognized very quickly that it was very much how I saw feng shui, which is obviously everybody in Wendy's group here is familiar somewhat at some level with feng shui. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that connection in a few minutes. But, um, but interesting, this biophilia means, um, biophilic design is to maintain, enhance, restore the experience of nature in our built environment. And, um, that's what biophilic design basically is. Um, how I see it is just imagine for a moment, let's just close our eyes. Oh, and before you close your eyes, I would like to um, let everybody know that if you have any questions, please just put it in the chat or if you're on Facebook, the chat, um, Wendy's going to be able to let me know if you have any questions. Um, especially if they're timely, you know, related to what I'm talking about at the moment. I, I love questions. I love interaction. I really prefer that rather than being a talking head. So um, please ask, ask away. And at the end also, we'll have time for questions because it's not a, a long presentation. And I am monitoring the chat. So please feel free. Great, great. So Okay, so let's go back and close your eyes for a moment. 
And just imagine that you're in a prison. You're in a jail cell. And look around you in your mind's eye in this space that you're kind of creating. What are the qualities of that space? What are the walls like, the floor, the bed? Views, if there is any window. And of course, most importantly, is how that space makes you feel. So, okay, so let's just kind of come back gently. And yeah, that certainly is not a very um, nurturing place to be. Um, and if anyone wants to type in the chat or, or say it, what kinds of things they noticed in that environment. If it was a prison, it did not make me feel very nice. Right, so there was probably hard surfaces, right? You were enclosed in completely hard surfaces, maybe cinder block or concrete. And cold, cold surfaces, hard surfaces. The colors were gray and, and very, uh, Kathleen on Facebook says sterile. I agree, Kathleen. Yeah. And what about noises? Well, I didn't really think of noises, but um, Marianne says no color, no life. Mm, I didn't think no of noises, but I, I would expect there'd be the noises of people in the other cells, which I wouldn't like. Kathleen mm. also says claustrophobic. You nailed oh, Kathleen. Yeah, yeah very claustrophobic. Did, did anybody see a window in their jail cell? Because mine didn't have a window. I was going to die. <laughs> I saw a window, oh, but it wasn't. Had a window. <laughs> I'm sorry. Marianne had a little window. Yeah, I had a window, but you know, of course, with bars on it, and and probably more of an urban view than uh, of nature, right? Yeah. So these, you know, I was getting to the 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 sound is more of you know loud, um, mm -hmm. echoing. You know, you could hear walks, you know, footsteps, you could hear fighting, you know. Um, Marianne says metallic sounds. Yeah, Kathleen, yeah. Kathleen, clinking Kathleen, she had no windows. <laughs> yeah. You, you really, guys, make everybody visualizes jail cell very well. That was awesome. Awesome. But we don't want to be there. No. We don't want to be there in that feeling for any longer than we have to. So now let's close our eyes and think of the most amazing garden. You're sitting surrounded by nature. What do you see? What do you hear? What are the surfaces, shapes? And of course, mostly, how do you feel? I feel like I'm home. <laughs> you are uniquely <laughs> at home in that garden. Maybe not, I don't know where everyone else lives, but uh, yeah, no, that is uh, fabulous. You, we should all feel home. I shouldn't say that. I uh, okay, we have definitely some. feel that energy. So any comments there? Okay, let's see what's story. coming up from the chat. Anybody in the Zoom room want to say anything? Please chime in. I'm checking Facebook. Welcome, Janelle. Lovely to have you.
Somebody said peaceful. Kathleen said peaceful. Nourished. Yeah. And there's obviously organic surfaces, you know, dirt or grass or moss or something that's soft, maybe even stone um, pavers or, or natural stone. There's an abundance of shapes and colors. Um, of course, natural light. Smells, sounds of nature, right? Bird song, maybe bees buzzing around. Yeah, I mean, like this guy sitting in this garden here. The huge between these two is and engaging all of our senses. We and have, one, may I interrupt for a second? Is, we have um, yes. Kathleen saying water running in a brook over stone, soothing. And Mary Ann in the Zoom room saying she imagined Monet's garden with color, movement, and sweet flowers. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so, so one environment is really engaging our senses, and one is numbing them. Not out, not not at all engaging them. There's no variety. There's, there's no life in that type of space. And I love this quote. I pulled it out of one of the books. The human mind and body evolved in a sensorially rich world. One that continues to be critical to people's health, productivity, and layers with, with variety. That is what we need. And if you think about it, um, that is exactly what feng shui is about. One of the biggest concepts in feng shui is yin and yang, or yang, however you want to say it. And they're complementary opposites. So, you know, yin is soft, dark, um, quiet, where yang is loud, bright, hard. And having a combination and interactions of all of those is what is important in our spaces. Um, we can have a space in our home or workspace that's too young. And that means it's overstimulating. It's way too bright, loud, hot, um, hard. And another, and another, you know, could be very, very yin. And it's too dark, cold, too soft. I don't know if there's, I guess, too, you know, not variety. Um, monotone, um, the, those two concepts are so important to our feeling of um, they go, oh, oh, should I like go around and kind of like check off in each of my rooms, like how much yin and yang or the five elements or whatever which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and I'm like, you know what? At a very basic level, no, just go into that space and see how do you feel there? Because if you feel good and nourished in that space, chances are the balance of yin and yang is probably pretty good. But if you have a room in your home or workspace that just feels draining or too stimulating, you know, two ends of the... Uh, spectrum, it probably means it's out of balance and it needs the opposite in order to put it back into balance. And I do firmly believe that a good part of the feng shui that we do in our spaces is, is to balance yin and yang. So um, really, really important. 
I'm going to interrupt for a sec. Janelle, could you possibly mute your mic, honey? It's, it's, um, you're getting a lot of your noises. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, so this I idea of activating and engaging our senses is like really, really fundamental to organic design, nature design, biophilic design, feng shui, whatever you want to call it. And talking about the connection with feng shui uh, even further, um, one of the quotes, it's probably a Chinese proverb, um, living in harmony with the earth brings good fortune or something like that. I might be paraphrasing, but one of my teachers way back when I first started learning feng shui um, said that in class. And I was like, oh, wow. Because for me, it brought everything like full circle to me, everything that I'm passionate about, everything that I believe in, you know, um, being in harmony with the earth, being more sustainable, being eco-friendly, being not just sustainable and eco-friendly, but developing a relationship with the natural world and the beings of the natural world and not objectifying them. Um, just, oh, there's a tree over there or there's a rock. It's, there's a being over there. There's a consciousness over there. Um, and to honor and respect the earth. Um, I always felt from the very beginning of learning feng shui that this is part of a spiritual practice. And, um, and biophilic design is just another take on it. But to me, biophilic design is also with the ultimate goal of a spiritual practice. Because if we have greater awe and respect for the natural world, we're going to, our behavior will be better, right? It's, it's a whole, right, a whole package. And it's really interesting um, hearing about other perspectives of feng shui. Um, I practiced and I believe, Wendy, you're BTB, right? Yes. BTB, okay. And you probably know what BTB is, but I'm just gonna say it for some people that may be on here that don't know. It's the black hat or black sect, Buddhist um, flavored uh, for better term. Uh, form of feng shui. And it really, really, uh, of all of the feng shui schools, it immerses in this um, deep respect and awe of nature. Um, it infuses with Taoism, with Buddhism, with mantras, with ceremony to honor the earth. Um, and, and really encapsulates this proverb here. Um, so where was I going with that? Um, yeah, the, so, so the school of feng shui that we practice, Wendy and I, and some of you on here, I'm sure, um, is very spiritual focused. That is the perspective um, that we were taught. But there are other schools, in fact, the classical schools, um, there, there can be a more uh self-interest type of worldview behind it more of i'll create feng shui so i can thrive so i can do better than everyone else in my neighborhood or um it's it's more of a um yeah i have to say self-interest putting yourself above others um and there is this type of energy that's associated with some of the um, classical schools in that it's very imperial. It you know, comes from uh, ancient, well, maybe not ancient, but more um, thousand years old, say Chinese imperialism um, that feng shui was used for. So, um, so it's really different worldviews, I think, um, when it comes to feng shui and, and biofield design, there's also 
some different views. It's more of, um, well, well, I'll get into that shortly. Let me just explain these images that you're looking at here on the screen. Um, I was so fortunate to visit Falling Water, which is Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece in uh, North, I'm sorry, Southwestern Pennsylvania last year. And I took these photos. Um, and the one on the left is the iconic photo, um, but I actually took that one because there is a spot where they say, okay, now you can take the photo. So it looks like um, if you Google falling water, it'll look just like that. Um, it's a spectacular home that is built on a waterfall um, and incorporates so much of the natural environment. All the stone is quarried locally. Um, the, the layout of the space, cantilevers over this waterfall. Um, and it actually is mimicking a waterfall in its design. You could see this, you know, height. There's actually a building back here, and then it, get, you know, progressively gets lower and lower following the flow of that waterfall. And yes, he was way before his time because this was built, I think, in the 40s. Um, and biofield design wasn't um, kind of assembled as a, a design aesthetic until like the late 90s. So, um, but yeah, he is definitely um, of a biofield design kind of mindset on connecting people with the natural world. Um, feng shui wise, you know, we could definitely have a debate on the um, the viability of this as a home, someplace to live. Um, being right on a waterfall uh, is very, you know, unstable, even though it's, you know, firmly planted in the ground, but it, it's still a very unstable type of space. It was very, it was not successful as a residential home. It was very successful for parties and for um, uh, hosting, hosting events and stuff. And it still is, and it's very successful as a museum type of piece. Um, and then of course, these pictures on the inside, it's just very organic. You can kind of see like the fabrics or like linens, um, the colors are all natural. There's just amazing views and natural light, um, which are all, part of what biofield of design is. Um, so just wanted to share that particular space um, before we go into all the different elements of um, biofield of design. Well, Maureen, perhaps you could give uh, everyone a little understanding of what biophilic design is. Okay, so I didn't, I, I, yeah, right. So I talked about um, biophilia is the love of living things. So biofield of design is this um, design practice of bringing the natural world into our spaces um, so that because, I mean, there's lots of reasons why. Um, I think over the decades of kind of the industrial revolution in the century and then more recent decades of all of the uh, man-made materials that we've brought into our spaces, um, you know, no longer living in like wood frame homes with wood floors, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people aren't, um, and, and synthetic materials brought in that there was this great disconnection in our living spaces. And even more so, think about that prison in our workspaces. For many of us, our workspaces aren't very different from that prison scene. I know I've worked in places that were pretty close to <laughs> what I uh, envisioned as a jail cell. So um, very much we are living and working um, in places that are devoid of nature. And we are also um, in inside buildings, 90% or more of our days. You know, we're not working in agriculture, like the predominant occupation is being outside doing things. Most of us work 
in indoors in some capacity. So um, this great disconnection has led to all sorts of um, challenges physically, mentally, emotionally, and then of course, spiritually. And it is actually kind of severed us from that, that feeling of that oneness with the natural world. It's kind of out there and us, we're separate. Um, many people are actually fearful. Um, I mean, like Wendy uh, is just telling me about all these you know, all these living things that come into our home because it's so open and it's, it's, it's inviting them in. Some people would be like, oh my God, I would die if I saw, a, you know, that bug in my, oh my God, I couldn't handle it. You know, it's like people are fearful of nature and it, you know, that's kind of where, that's kind of one of the reasons why we're in this situation we're in, um, when it comes to, you know, uh, climate change and, you know, destroying the world. So, um, so all of this over decades, all these ideas started coming together. And there's a couple of people that were really champions behind it. Stephen Keller, who was um, a former professor at Yale University School of Forestry. And then we had Edward O. Wilson, who is a natural biologist. Some of you may know his work with ants. He's from Alabama and um, he has, um, he uh, unfortunately both have passed uh, fairly recently, but they both had this amazing um, kind of partnership together to, to put forward uh, symposiums to get people together from all different types of occupations from psychologists to architects to contractors to, I mean, just like designers, all this um, building community, academia, and they kind of pulled together these principles. And it wasn't really, the first principles came, came through in the early 2000s. I found biofield design in 2008, and I've been studying it since. And ever since um, Keller came out with his first set of principles, it's morphed and there's, you know, new principles being introduced or actually not new, more of regrouping and categorizing them, really. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting um, for me, I felt like finally people that are more say rational minded in occupations that are traditionally more mainstream like architecture, building, you know, contracting, um, maybe even academia, um, psychology, all people from all of these disciplines are realizing that our spaces are so powerful and impact us so greatly that they have done all this research around. I'm sorry, Wendy. Yeah, I actually have someone in the Facebook group asked if you can give us some practical examples of ways that they can bring biophilic design into their homes and uh, in, with a, you know, ju without just only dealing with plants. So they would like some real applications for themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're gonna go through each element. I just wanna share a chart that I created, which is my version of just recategorizing the principles based around the five elements because, well, anyone who knows me knows. <laughs> I'm obsessed with the five elements of feng shui. So um, let me just go there. So, so these are my principles. They're in my book, Creating Luminous Spaces. Um, but these are the five elements. I'm sure you all are familiar somewhat with them. And I've just, like I said, took their principles and, and just reorganized them. So we're not going to go into detail on this because this is just, you know, kind of heavy detail, but I'm going to share with you some slides of, of spaces. So the wood element is, I call it movement and vitality. Um, and there's more to it than that. Yes, 
the wood element is associated with plants and trees and you know vegetation. So that is like the big easy thing to do to bring biophilia into your space is bringing some plants in. So of course, like a potted plant, I mean, look at this amazing living wall. None of us are gonna be able to do that in our spaces, but a miniature version of this could be kind of fun. Um, preserved moss art. And it doesn't need any care because it's preserved, but it's a beautiful green and they have all sorts of things. So if you Google preserved moss art, you're going to find lots of Etsy accounts and, you know, and support your, your artists. Um, it's really fun. But one of the other things with, um, with, uh, the wood element is the fact that obviously it's wood furnishings. And like, I love this little table here um, that was, you know, using a piece of wood uh, from a tree, um, a slice of a tree, which I just absolutely love. And it, it brings much more life than just a plank table or something because there's this, the rings, it just shows more life and vitality there. Although any wood like i've got this desk here that's just made of a plank of wood wood grain is known to calm us tremendously um and, and just kind of bring the heart rate down and just make us uh feel more calm than if we had say a formica type of surface so of course at home we tend to have more wood furnishings in our home but in an office space, um, rather than having like a white formica table, having a wood grain table is great. But okay, and then you're gonna notice that picture that's like a picture of a, a scene out a window. Wood is about vitality, right? It's about the life cycles. So being able to witness the change of seasons out your window is really important and that is amazing and yes hopefully we all have that now if you like live in an inner city you might not have that opportunity unless there's um a tree outside but most of us do have that and it's known that even if you can't have a view of nature artwork with nature um is almost as good it's incredible So that's the wood element. May I, may I add something? Um, for sure. Before we, we leave the wood element for Kathleen, because she was asking about other ways of bringing nature in other than plants. If we, I know we're going to go into all the elements, but if you wanted to find other ways of adding the wood element, not just plants themselves, but flowers and uh, essential oils are very representative of the wood element. And you can also bring the, the, the feeling that, that if you choose your essential oils well, you can add whatever natural outdoor yes. scent that you want to flavor your room with or your home with, and it acts on you at a very deep level. Go ahead. Yes, that's that's a great um, suggestion, Wendy, because we're talking about activating our senses, not just visual, but sense of smell is so important. Absolutely. Um, and also sound as we go through it's there's there's opportunities here um, for for uh, all of the senses okay so the the fire element i call it illumination and connection and um and it's obviously um wildlife so having access to wildlife um being able to see wildlife so you know sometimes in order to see wildlife, you need to attract it, right? So bird feeders, um, bird baths, um, you know, other things that will, bat house, I mean, like things that will attract wildlife. Um, of course, planting shrubs and flowers that the bees and, and other wildlife will enjoy, the butterflies, um, that's all great um, because attracting wildlife is that connection to another living, um, breathing, uh, being, and then of course, lighting, um, you know, yeah, fire is light. It's sunlight. 
It's also artificial light. That's another way to kind of bring fire into our spaces. It's also bright colors and it's playfulness. And this is something that um, is very much uh, biophilic design is, is incorporating a sense of lighthearted um, touches, playful. Um, I kind of used, I was kind of figuring out where to put this one image to um, the bottom left here. I just love this image. And um, it's, it's actually, you know, a glass floor that is above a stream underneath the house. So kind of like a falling water type of thing, but you know, just a stream, not a waterfall. Um, I put it here because I could have put it in the water. I could have put it in, um, I forget where else I was thinking, but I really liked it here because it's kind of playful. Like, oh, you know, this is fun. This is interesting. It's childlike. So, um, so bringing, um, for you in your home, it's again, it's like bringing in things that will attract wildlife around you, um, fun lighting, um, and playfulness to your space and color. I want to add something. This is for Petal. Petal, I'm sure this That's is Mama. <laughs> this is a new idea for bringing the um, outdoors into your home, having underwater a, a glass floor with water underneath. <laughs> Yeah, I love this one. <laughs> no, it's yeah, not I go ahead. I think it's so fun. Yeah, it, it doesn't it, to me it would fit into the water element more than the fire element, but it's still a unique idea. That's one I hadn't thought of for bringing yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely bringing water in when you think of it elementally, but and also the curved lines of that hallway, right? Oh, water. Um, yeah. a very water. Yeah. But it is, you know, it's coming from that sense of playfulness. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, that's great. And again, anyone, please share. So, uh, any questions? Okay, so the, the next one, is, I call it the middle way. Um, it's the earth element. And, and you know, earth uh, is stone, it's rock. Um, so, yeah, I've just got some really good uh, examples here of bringing in, you know, natural stone, uh, sustainably sourced, of course, is always best. And locally sourced is also best because the earth element is about here and now. It is about a sense of place. It's acknowledging like the heritage of where you are. And, um, and that's a really lovely way to do that is to actually bring materials that are locally sourced. Um, it's also like looking at it from a bigger perspective. It could be historical connection to the land. So one of my clients was, um, oh gosh, now I'm gonna forget what city, but I, it was in Kansas or Missouri. Um, it was the beginning of the, uh, it, it, it is situated right at the beginning of the, um, what was, oh gosh. <sighs> um, oh, now I can't remember it, but it, it had like a really important historical connection. And I said they should have a painting or artwork of that particular thing. Oh, was it the... Um, it was the horses that would go from like Missouri out to um, California. They would do the Wells Fargo or something like that. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm totally losing that connection. But, but anyhow, um, in order to honor that, I suggested having that in their like employee area because it's like a sense of pride. It kind of helps people to feel like they know where they are. Another thing, which um, probably in the last couple of uh, decades, airlines used to be pretty generic. They used to be pretty straightforward. They were the same no matter where you were in the world. Probably over the last few decades, they've become much more um, connected to this, the, the 
the sense of where they are. So, you know, when you fly into New York, you're going to see images of, you know, the Brooklyn Dodgers or, you know, the Statue of Liberty, things like that. Um, when you go into Denver, you see um, the, the whole airline, uh, airport is made to look like snow covered Rocky Mountains. I mean, um, you know, and of course they bring that out in all the artwork around and um, really connect to the sense uh, the, the land itself in a geologic, uh, cultural, historical way. And that is just so cool. So how can you do that? Um, obviously picking up some rocks from your local beach and putting them in a bowl. There you go. It's, it's where you are. Um, and, you know, foraging and um, connecting with your land in a, in a deeper way. Um, is part of this. Um, maybe recognizing or honoring uh, something either cultural, historical, geologic that is in your area, in your home with artwork. If that, if that connects with you. And then in this other scene here, you know, this is just, um, Another way to connect with earth is just, you know, open scenes of open land um, and vistas. Other ways that we can bring the earth element in, especially in the Caribbean. She, um, Maureen was talking about bringing stones in from the beach, but we also have sand. And of course we have all river stones. And we have, of course, all the beautiful ornaments and things that made out of ceramics and clays that our artisans make. Anytime you bring those things in, you are bringing the earth element into your home. Absolutely, yeah. Seashells, Kathleen says. I would say that adds, um, seashells, Kathleen would bring some earth element and also the animal that was in it. So it might, might bring some, something else as well, like the fire element, depending on the seashells or conch shells with all the points and the colors. So we'd be bringing in more um, elements when you do that. But the point is you are bringing the outdoors in so great idea for the seashells and absolutely shells. yeah absolutely i love that yeah there's no limit to what we can do yeah um bringing you know found objects into our spaces is great and the metal element um i call it shiny and clear <laughs> and um you know i just had so much fun with um with with kind of classifying um, all these different principles into the element system and then coming up with these names. But um, as we know, the metal element is so much about organization and structure um, and, you know, decluttering. So a great way to connect with the metal element in our spaces is to, um, is to organize and structure and, and, have systems in place where you could put things you, you know everything has its place um and that's very much connecting with this um element there's lots of research and i know i didn't really even get into this at all but um i mentioned that there was um lots of conferences with lots of different types of a variety of professional people and what came out of these conferences and actually wound up being part of them in future ones is tons of research, tons and tons of environmental psychology research studies showing how connecting to nature in our spaces makes us feel better in all those ways that we talked about, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So um, one of the studies, that's not necessarily biophilic design study, but it is this concept of um, complexity in our spaces. And um, just like we were talking about yin and yang, you know, you could have too much or too little um, or extremes of things. When we have too much clutter in our spaces, it's too stimulating. When we have too little, like minimalistic, like super minimalistic, it's not stimulating enough. So we're much more comfortable in places in the middle, which according to this research, they call it 
moderate complexity. So we, um, and it's not just clutter, but it's, it's just um, patterns. And clutter can be, you know, can, we can intake that in our visual cortex as patterns when we see lots of things around, but it's also patterns in, in furniture and you're like, you got an area rug. Um, when you overdo it, like if that chair had a different pattern on it and the wall had wallpaper, and then of course the bookshelf is pretty full, it would be like overwhelming. So it's a balance of that, uh, about that energy. So it's moderate complexity. And that is definitely um, related to metal. And then we've got sacred geometry, which comes from nature. So, um, so somebody mentioned the seashells, um, you know, seashells, some of them have like that amazing uh, pattern of sacred geometry built within them, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and, you know, that is just beautiful. So it could be artwork, but we could bring in sunflowers and they have that amazing, that the middle of the sunflower has the seeds, have that amazing arrangement of sacred geometry within them. And, you know, so does trees, so do plants. They all have this beautiful, natural geometry that we love, that we, in our best art, try to mimic. In our worst art and creation of things, we don't do it well. We don't get it right. But when it's done right, it's so beautiful. And that's why natural things in our spaces, no matter what it is from a plant to a seashell, um, it just brings that beautiful harmony into our lives. I also connect um, the air and breezes into a space. Now, just seeing that curtain flowing into the room, I'm just doing a time check. Oh my gosh, I'm running a little late. Um, uh, the curtain um, is like a non-rhythmic repeat in our, of movement in our space. It's, it's not like a clock. It's not like the curtain opens and closes and opens and closes and opens and closes. That would be like a, you know, a mechanical movement. This is very fluid. So something like that having the natural airflow and then just having that um, curtain just to move it is very soothing in our spaces. So those are just a few ideas for metal. And lastly, we have water. And of course, you know, having a water fountain, of course, that's like amazing water fountain there, but we could just have a little table fountain in our homes um, or an aquarium. Um, and, you know, water is also connected to curves and movement of energy, like round shapes. So I call it wabi sabi and flow because it's just kind of like very organic looking like the statue here um, and this um, potted tree um, is it's very wabi sabi uh, type of energy which is just kind of, um, it is what it is. You know, this is like processes of time give it the patina um, of, of time. So those are beautiful to kind of bring into our spaces. Anything that reminds us of the passage of time. So like if you have a, a well-worn chair that, you know, you could, you could see that somebody's moved this chair, that, you know, it's, it's got kind of the oils from the hand. Um, there's love in that. That's like a wabi-sabi energy. And that's definitely connected with water. Um, and then water is also connected with a, fun, a bunch of very fun things. Um, it is playful as well as fire. Um, mystery and enticement, which these little lights are beckoning us up to the top we're just drawn to it. We just have to walk up there. I mean, like, I, I can't imagine being in the space 
and not taking a walk up there. And that is also a very important component to incorporate, uh, you know, when we can, when it can be done. Um, little mystery and enticement. And um, they do this in buildings. I mean, if you, if you, after this presentation, if you Google feng shui, um, biofield design, you'll see lots of um, images of different types of um, takes on doing this in our in spaces but you know not having a straight hallway but having a curved one so you can't really see where it's going um and it's enticing so you know lighting would make it enticing to go down this hallway in this say a hotel hotels hospitality are really great with bringing biofield design into their spaces um other ones are that are connected to the water element, um, risk and peril, um, which uh, sounds really god awful. Um, why would you want to do that? And yeah, it's definitely not something we typically use in our residential homes. But there is a little bit of um, it's it's manageable risk. So even having like um, a grand staircase where you stand at the top and you've got a railing, but there's a little bit of a, ooh, you know, that height. Height is often connected with that kind of risk and peril type of thing, or even like a pool with a diving board. That's that risk and peril type of thing. Um, if any of you have ever seen or been to the Grand Canyon in the last probably 15 years, uh, 20 years maybe, they have a cantilever that goes out that's glass. So you're walking across glass or you know, plexiglass, whatever it is. And you can see the canyon below you. So that's definitely a great way to bring risk and peril into that space. Um, and um, lastly, a sense of awe. And there's, um, you know, in our residential homes, Awe would be, um, well, I mean, if you are lucky enough to have an amazing view from your home, that would definitely be connecting to the sense of awe. Um, and uh, artwork could do that as well. Um, it's really um, things that, um, Yeah, artwork that is just really inspiring and intricate, uh, made with a lot of artistry, um, can inspire a sense of awe. And I neglected to say with the wood element, going back to the very beginning with the wood element um, and the fire element, so a way to connect with the two of them very simply is to, if you're working from home, is to move your desk in a place where you've natural light. That's fire. Natural light is the most important thing that we can connect with in our spaces because of all of the research that shows um, the indicators, <clears throat> like I said, in all those ways body, mind, and spirit, but also because we know we just feel better. We intuitively know we feel better when we have natural light in our spaces. Of course, we don't want light that's blinding us, but natural light um, and views of nature. Those two things are, well, and plants. Um, those three things, <laughs> those three things, natural light, views of nature and plants, um, and whatever you can do around that are huge ways to connect to the natural world. Um, yeah. So, Wendy. Yes, more. <clears throat> yes, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, I went through them all. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Well, uh, I tell you what, let's go back, uh, stop sharing your screen. Let's go back to where we can see everybody and perhaps they'll have questions when we are yeah. in the gallery. 
So Petal, I, I do expect you to have questions. So jump in. I was listening intently. Um, no questions really. It was interesting for the to see the overlay for me between the feng shui elements and the sustainability principles of biophilic design. Um, yeah, so it there is of course that natural synergy as Maureen has demonstrated through her diagrammatic representation there. So it was really interesting to see some of these. Oh, uh, I know. I would I would love to see wild lotus with anything uh, like that. I have to see you. <clears throat> an iPad, iPad Pro. So, so what the summary of what I think what what Maureen um, shared with us is that in order to to bring nature inside, you're really looking at bringing the elements of nature inside, and there's so many different ways of doing that. So that you don't when you think of the um, which 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 you most of you are familiar with the five elements because it's one of my loves as well. If you think I'm bringing nature within, you don't only have to think of plants. You don't only have to think of 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 um, you know flowers. You don't you, you think of the five elements, and there's so many different ways of bringing them in. I mean, Maureen, that uh, that example you had with the white curtain blowing in the breeze. I mean, I, you know, we 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 wouldn't have thought of that as a way of bringing nature inside, but it is. It has the element of flow. It lets the natural light in with a, with a, with a with with a softness. And so there's many, many different ways that we can do homemade biophilic design if we are aware of the, 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 how to represent the five elements. I think Kathleen was really pleased when I mentioned the essential oils that resonated with her as a way of bringing the wood element in. Not everybody can bring a lot of plants inside their space because maybe they don't have a huge space. Uh, they can bring little plants or flowers or have essential oils. The water element, <coughs> You, you don't have to have a swimming pool, but you could have a little water element. You can have something yeah. that goes drip, drip, bubble, bubble, or tinkle, tinkle, instead of a wall of water coming down your house. The interesting thing for me was that, that floor, the glass floor with the water. Maureen, I tell you, I'm not going to be living in a house with a glass floor or moving water myself, but it's beautiful to think about it and to watch it, but I'm not, I would not find it comfortable for me. I need to be more grounded. So I probably I need to have the wood or the earth element below under my feet, right? Um, but it was just lovely to see how tying the just thinking in terms of the five elements gives you a framework for bringing nature within in so many different beautiful ways, and it's only limited by your imagination. Does anybody want to add to that? I did. I I just wanted to say that I really um one of the things that I appreciate about biophilic design is the number of ways we have to bring those elements into our spaces. And the patterns that nature provides us is great inspiration. We don't always have to, as you say, look for a plant, but the, the patterns on leaves, the patterns, you know, even on a tree trunk, a cross section of a tree trunk even, mm -hmm. is very similar to a fingerprint. So things like that, when we start to look at them differently, we see how they can energize us, you know, as sources of these, these elements. And petal not only energize, but they also feel it, you get a feeling of, how, of harmony. There's, there's a harmony, a resonance within us when we have those patterns near in our space. And again, if you look at, think in terms of the seashells or the swirls on, on, on some of, the, some of the, the, the seashells or the conch shells, if you, if you look at the way they're formed inside, those, those uh, sacred corals geometry. look like brain. When you look at corals, <laughs> and so many times the coral looks like a brain. That's you know, right. and to me, those are all forms of sacred geometry. And yep. just by having them near to us, we get the energy. We get our energy realigns. Crystal, we have somebody here. I think I don't know if she's just just checked out, but we had Crystal Susan on on, and she does deals with crystals and the energies of crystals, which is by the way another way of bringing. Uh, the, the earth element or the metallic element, element or different elements into your home using crystals. I, I think she's gone, but it would have been lovely to hear her take on that. So yes, corals look like brains or fire, <laughs> depending on the coral. <laughs> so especially in the Caribbean, we are so blessed with so many natural um, 
natural elements, natural patterns, natural ways that we can bring things into our homes. And, and um, I, yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why I live here. And, and I neglected to say that, you know, with all this research, um, there's lots of different industries that have been working um, to bring biophilic design in. And one of the most important is uh, healthcare. And I mean, you know, anyone who's been in a hospital in the last two decades probably have noticed that there's at least artwork with nature scenes throughout hallways. You know, that's like, okay, you know, that's like a very low level biophilic design, but hey, you know, it's better than nothing. Or even like the, you know, the curtains in the patient rooms will have like leaf patterns or something that's very biophilic on them. Um, so, you know, even hospitals that are not renovating, that are just doing like little updates can, can really make a difference in how people feel and work there. And, you know, um, and, and even during the beginning of the pandemic, there were these, um, one of the hospitals here in New York, Mount Sinai Hospital, got this recharge room for, um, for the doctors and nurses. And they would go in and it would be a screen with um, like loops of nature scenes. So they could go, oh, you know, on the top of a mountain or on a beach and they would just sit there and they would hear and they would look at the screen and like just de-stress, um, which is something that, wow, you know, there's so much potential um, schools. Um, I actually have a student in one of my classes who is building got a grant to build, uh, you know, update a room for biophilic design and do some research. So it's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. No, I love There's that. There's so idea. much potential. I love the idea. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the lead and the green building certifications coming into play there. They've really amped up the importance of light, as you mentioned, the natural light and ventilation Petal, since the you, pandemic. Could you, on, could you come on screen and just tell Maureen a little bit about what you've been doing? If that's okay, folks, we are going into overtime. I hope that's all right. But Petal studies uh, um, biophilic design as well. So this is her thing. Go ahead. Um, a lot of the, well, I'm not an architect. I'm not a trained architect, but I, because of my work, I do interact with a lot of them. And the green building certification programs like LEED and WELL have really stepped up their um, performance requirements. For, for being certified under those programs in terms of ventilation, things like ventilation and then use of materials. Yeah. Um, you yeah. were talking about sourcing materials and the materials we use in constructing our spaces. So those are areas that are getting a lot more attention um, for people like architects and builders and um, other trades people in the construction sector. Yes. Yes. So it's yeah. really um it's really interesting because then there's the other end as well, um, where you have the the, the the people who are going to rent these spaces or the people who are going to buy these homes, they're coming in much more informed and they're looking for these things as selling points, you know. So right. it's 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 really great to see that sustainability and biophilia is getting some more prominence lately. Oh um, not because COVID was a good thing, but it has brought about this awareness, this greater awareness. Absolutely, Petal. And I mean, one, one little um, measurement that I've been keeping track of is a Google alert with the word biophilic design in it. And I, I probably started it back in 2010, 2012, and it would be like once a week, I'd get maybe one Google alert on an article, you know? Now I get several a day emails and there's sometimes five or six articles in one email. Um, so it, it's just exploding and it's still, even though it's becoming more, you know, more known, it's still at the very infancy. So many architects are still going, what, bio, what? Well, you I know, have to tell you, Maureen, um, Petal is here in Tobago, and her mission is to get those architects on board, because this is what she studied, and, and she is trying to make sure that they are aware. Correct, Petal? Awesome. That's just it. That is exactly it. I am trying to get not just architects, but engineers, 
uh, contractors, any and everybody who is in the building and construction space to start to think about their projects and their, their jobs and their work in general yeah. from a sustainable standpoint. Right. And if, okay. if we do that, we'll avoid a lot of the issues health-wise that we are seeing happening now. Right. I mean, and sustainability is that one thing, right? Yeah. And then you've got human. So it's, yeah. it's low impact on the earth, which is sustainability. And then there's well-being for humanity. And that's it's supposed to be married. Yes. It's so important. Yeah. So important. Okay, so I'm going to ask Maureen, can you tell the, the tribe and any of all the visitors how they can get in touch with you and if there's anything special that you have going on that they should know about? Because we oh, are actually, we into tomorrow right now. <laughs> so we're going to have to wrap it up soon. <laughs> yes, um, you can find me at luminous-spaces.com. So it's luminous spaces with a little dash in between. Um, that's my website, and that's where I have um, all of my uh, services and, and course offerings. And um, right now, I'm actually um, uh, opening up for the first time in two years a live class in biophilic design based on the Luminous Spaces biophilic design principles. It starts next week. Um, and I was closed, I closed enrollment, I'm closing enrollment today, but if anybody here really would like to get in, you could just, um, you know, do so um, pretty quickly because all the content went out for the first class, which is next Wednesday. Um, the and that program will run through Mar uh, April third. Um, I'm sorry, August third. So it's uh, it's like five weeks. It's once a week, um, one five for five weeks. Yes. Yeah, except the last week we have two classes. But um, but I do want to offer anybody here um, a special ten percent off, and you could use a code uh, Nature Ten. Pretty simple, and you'll get ten percent off. Yeah, Maureen. What I'll do is when when I do uh, post the video, I'll ask you to put that in the chat so that sure. any, anybody who's watching the replay can find it easily. So on behalf of all of us, I, I'm going to read what Petal said. She said, that was fabulous. <laughs> A deep bow and big thank you to Maureen. So on behalf of the tribe, Maureen, thank you so much for joining us. Maureen's people, thank you for coming. We really welcome you. And we will be, um, uh, as, I, as I said, I will be posting the video and sharing the link to the YouTube video with Maureen in case any more of her tribe wants to see it. Many thanks to all of you who watched us live in Zoom and live on Facebook. We appreciate you. Bye for now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Bye.